Hello, hello, and welcome once again to another edition of a Beatles podcast, which is called Things We Said Today. This is usually a weekly podcast where we talk about what's going on in the world of the Beatles news-wise, and there's always a lot of things going on in the news. Nobody knows that better than my co-host. My name is Ken Michaels, known for my Beatles show called Every Little Thing, which is syndicated around the country, and I'm joined by... Steve Marinucci, who writes for many Examiner columns, perhaps best known for Beatles Examiner. Hello, Steve. Hey, Ken. Hey, everybody. We're going to talk about something that actually Steve was quite proud of bringing up uh, in his column, which is the fact that some interviews that took place well over 20 years ago, uh, which actually come from a book called Off the Record by Joe Smith, who's a record executive who interviewed so many people in the music industry in different fields of the music industry artists producers executives people on the business side it's a fascinating book and when that book came out there was an interview in there with Paul McCartney one with George Harrison one with Yoko Ono and one with George Martin and they were all great as were all the other interviews and we've talked about this briefly in uh, previous shows but now uh, something interesting has developed whereby these interviews are now being posted online. And, Steve, you can tell our listeners about that. They were donated to the Library of Congress by, by Joe Smith. And the Library of Congress is putting a group of them online every couple of months. And they put, they put the first few, uh, first uh, 25 online in November. And I believe Rolling Stone reported the next batch is out in February. Mm. Um, and the first batch included the Paul McCartney, George Harrison, George Martin, and Yoko Ono interviews. And th- what's exciting about these things, number one, is they're historic because they're 20 years old. Everybody is, it, it, Smith is kind of like one of the guys. It's not like he's a member of the press. So the tone of the discussions is very relaxed. Because they're not, these are not kind of on the record. Um, I mean, the the book says off the record, but I mean, these are not you know formal statements, not public. They're not you know talking to a reporter. They're mm. just having a casual conversation. So there are things said that, well, for example, the Yoko Ono's been been has gotten a lot of attention because of her comments about the breakup. But you know, in actuality, you know these. Discussions are really, as the title says, they're off the record, and they're they're not meant. And I don't, I don't take them to be, you know, as serious and as, I don't know, landmark as 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 everybody did. Because number one, these are these are twenty years old now, and things have been said since. And every time you know something gets said, you know, people kind of focus in on it and go, oh, look what he said about the breakup, or look, you know, and and. But I mean, the the fascinating thing is that number one, he talked to so many people, right? And he got them to talk in depth about subjects that sometimes they don't normally talk about. And we're going to run through some um, yeah, some be- of the, the comments we, yeah. from the from the discussions uh-huh. from the uh, interviews. Yeah, I just wanted to say very quickly, and I know I said this in a previous show. I really enjoyed this book because what's the sign of a good book or a, a good interview is that. There could be people in there that normally you wouldn't even read about or have an interest in. But all of these interviews are fairly short, and they could be five pages long. And someone, like I remember, it just sticks out in my mind, there was an interview with Bobby Vinton, who I normally wouldn't even read about. Mm -hmm. But you pick this up, you start reading it, and it's very compelling. Everything that's in there is, is something very interesting. And when you get all these different angles from different people in the music biz, it makes it a very fascinating read. And, and, a, so, and an important point too about the Library of Congress site is that the 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 audio on the Library of Congress site is unedited. It's the full interviews. The book does not have the full interviews. Mm. So that's a you know that's important. And because um, uh, I, I believe the I believe these things go on for you know fifteen twenty minutes. So right. um, the book definitely doesn't have. You know the transcripts of all the discussions. There's only, there's only excerpts. But still, I mean, it's it's 
it's wonderful stuff. It's just it's very it's fascinating. Yeah, no matter well, who you pick up. Yeah, it, it comes across as being very open and frank and candid, and mm-hmm. it's very refreshing for that reason. And there are things that are said that may not shock you, but it's still interesting to hear it said if it's something that hasn't been said before. Right. So why don't we just um, highlight a few of them? We'll start with Yoko, and I know you you um, you picked out something in there that you found to be interesting from Yoko's okay. interview. Yoko Yoko talks uh, the the comments in in the Yoko interview. Um, never naturally, everybody kind of honed in on the breakup comments, but there were there were some her comments were there was a lot more there than I think people kind of realized. It, she says. Once we were together and the Beatles were breaking up for Johnny, obviously John Lennon, it was like a divorce. He felt good about the group breaking up like a big weight was off him, but at the same time, he was very proud of the group. He knew there was nothing that compared with the Beatles. He also had an extremely high opinion about each one, which might seem surprising. He used to say they were intelligent kids, and the fact they came from Liverpool, you would think they would not understand these things, but they do. He was always protective of them in that way. Hmm. See, I find that interesting because when she said that John felt that nothing could compare to the Beatles, Mm -hmm. he has said the exact opposite. If you go back to the David Wigg interview of 1971, where he's saying, we're all doing much better than we did as a group, obviously, you know, and giving credit to Yoko and Linda for breaking up the Beatles because, you know, if you perceive it that way, they should be given the credit for all the great solo music Mm -hmm. and being very proud of the Plastic Ono Band album and, you know, his, his solo work at that point. So, you know, I'm kind of surprised that Yoko said that about John saying that nothing co- would compare to what they did as a band. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's quite a bit in here where she goes on and on about the, about the breakup, but and she also says, I don't think he ever voiced anything about how he missed being in the Beatles, but that was because I was the other party that he got the divorce for. And I suppose I fell into that trap right away that he divorced them to marry me. But that doesn't mean I broke up the Beatles. I didn't break up the Beatles. The Beatles were getting very independent, each one of them. And Johnny was not, in fact, the first one who wanted to leave the Beatles. So that I, and, and, but, I mean, that just basically, that gives more of a, you know, more of an idea that, that the, the breakup hurt John more than he let on. And that's, you know, that's pretty significant. Hmm. But at the same time, that's that's also interesting to me, because although we know that Ringo left the Beatles during the White Album and George left during Let It Be, John has openly said that he was thinking about leaving as, as early as when he was doing How I Won the War. Right. So that was before Ringo left. Mm-hmm. He may not have physically got up and left the group, but he was certainly thinking about it. Right. But what she had said about the breakup that I think... Um, got a lot of attention was more the fact that um, that Paul was trying to take over the group. It wasn't just the fact that the others were uh, leaving the group. Paul wanted the group to be more, you know, his band at the time, as if he was the leader. Right. Which doesn't, that's not a shock to me at all, only because of the fact that given what John has said, that he was more interested in doing projects with Yoko. He was getting less and less interested in the Beatles. That meant that Paul had to step up and lead the group and push it, them. Here's, here's that quote. It says, but then again, the other three felt that Paul was trying to hold the Beatles together as his band. They were trying to be like Paul's band, which they did not like. And so, you know, that there's a little bit of that in Let It Be. I mean, if you sit there and watch, you know, the the way things go in the, in the movie. I mean, that's not really a breaking news. Right, I know, but it's, it's all perception there. Mm-hmm. Because as far as I'm concerned, George and Ringo, despite the fact that they left at different times there and came back, I don't think either one of them would have been the reason why the Beatles broke up. I mean, they, they wouldn't have been the ones to officially leave causing a breakup. It had to come from John or Paul. And the fact that John physically left and made the announcement to the group tells you that it had to be one or the other to initiate the the real breakup, the physical breakup of the band. Right. But as John was getting less and less interested in, in staying in the Beatles, that meant that 
for the Beatles to continue to make records, to do any projects at all, doesn't matter what it was. Magical Mystery Tour, your favorite film. Um, it means that Paul had to step up and push the others more. And maybe in the eyes of the others, that looked to them as though Paul was really trying to take over. Right. So anyway, let's move on to George Martin. George Martin. Now, I, this quote uh, I found kind of interesting. He talked about talked about how he worked with them. And he said, I was very much in charge because I was kind of a schoolmaster teaching them everything. They had to do everything I told them. They brought me a raw song, and I'd tell them, this has got to last two and a half, three minutes. You just played me about 50 seconds of music, so let's make a little more out of this. I would structure it for them. I'd tell them two chords here. The second one needs a guitar solo. We need an introduction and an ending. Uh, Can't Buy Me Love is an example of that. The original song started with the verse, I felt Can't Buy Me Love worked better as an introduction. Of course, as the songs became more interesting and more complicated, and as the boys got to know the studio better, because they were very canny boys, it became more of a democratic team. Hmm. There you go with George, you know, talking specifically about how he worked together with the Beatles. And then a little further down, actually, I'm going to skip a paragraph. He says, gradually things changed. The boys went into their little spheres, and there was more of a rivalry brewing between John and Paul. In truth, they were never great collaborators in the sense of sitting down and writing together. They were never Rogers and Hart. One would would have an idea for a song. He'd go to the other guy and say, I need help on a line and you give it to me, that's how John and Paul c- collaborated. See, that I find fascinating. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's through George's own observances of how John and Paul worked together. Mm-hmm. But also keep in mind that he wasn't there necessarily when John and Paul wrote songs together. He was there in the studio with them for the most part. But so, his observations are, I mean, he's taking his observations from comparing from all the people he's worked with, and that's, that's kind of fascinating. Um, well, he, I think he compared them, if you were to compare them to Riders and Hart, it wasn't like a 50-50 collaboration right down the board with all their songs, and we all know that. Mm-hmm. But that will always be a fascinating part of their, of their story, how much the two of them really collaborated together. And I know it's something that I've found very interesting recently. In fact, there was an article that you wrote um, about Julia Baird's uh, recent book where there's a CD in there with an interview right. with Paul where he's saying in there that a lot of people think that John and I wrote mainly in the early years and we didn't really collaborate together later on, and there was a lot more collaboration than people realize. Mm-hmm. And that, so, but that, C, that CD, by the way, is fascinating. It's, he says there's stuff there, those interviews that that she did with him are nowhere else. So that's that's a really great disc to get. There's one more quote here that I'm going to I'm going to read from George Martin that continues what he what he says. He it says generally speaking their songs were pitched against each other. One would say, "Okay, you've written that. Now listen to mine." It was competitive collaboration. In fact, Paul misses it terribly now. He misses that spark of John being rude to him saying, "You can't write that, Paul. It's awful." Paul needs that and John was the only one who could really say that most effectively mm. to him. That's very interesting. Right that there. is very interesting. There, there's more. George Martin's actually is one of the better, the better interviews of of the ones that we're going to discuss. I mean, he really got into some some great stuff in here. And another thing he mentions is he was surprised it lasted so long. It la- you know, that it lasted eight years, which is kind of kind of interesting. Well, that. you know, I, I saw that comment too. And if you look at things the way that John looked at it. He would say a lot of people think that the Beatles only lasted a few years, but they really knew each other much longer. And if you go back to when John and Paul first met each other, which was 1957, and I know George joined the group a year later, you have to say another four or five years in their history. You're only looking at 62 to 1970. Right. And uh, I don't know. To me, they they did so much in such a compressed period of time, but I don't actually look at that as a long period of time. Mm-hmm. To me, I think it's it's extraordinary how much they did in in just seven eight years in the studio. Right, and uh, yeah, I've heard that. I mean, when you look across the the progression from the begin from say sixty three to seventy, the the progression is astounding. You know, mm. 
But I just want to make one comment about that thing about the collaboration because I know recently it was uh, the end of 2011 when Paul was doing The Word in concert. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, there's a great selection right there. And I'm sure some fans would have thought, oh, that's John's song. But I've read where it's supposed to be more of a an equal collaboration or that Paul wrote more than people are aware of in The Word. Mm -hmm. So there you go. There's one example of one song where there may have been more of a collaboration than people are aware of. We all right. know that the early songs, like I Want to Hold Your Hand and, and From Me to You and She Loves You, those are more 50-50. But there may have been more examples going on than we're aware of where they work more closely together. Okay. Shall we go to, I guess we'll go to a Beatle next. Okay, that's a good idea. I'm going to go to George Harrison next. George's comments are, are mostly centered around his solo career, but... He said, writing with Jeff Lynn is really the first time I've ever written with anyone. I wrote one tune with Dylan back in 69. I wrote one with Eric Clapton. I've helped Ringo finish songs. But I'm not the type of songwriter that says, let's sit down and write. Every Beatle album that had a song of mine on it, I wrote alone. John and Paul had been writing so much together. Once in a while, I got a line from John when I was stuck. But at the same time, I gave them lyrics. I helped out on Eleanor Rigby. I wrote some of the lyric of... Uh, to come together. There's there's something for you. Yeah. No, I I heard that about Eleanor Rigby. Mm-hmm. You know, I heard that, that uh, he might have come up with the line, oh, look at all the lonely people. Mm-hmm. You know, but I wish that George had said in that interview specifically what he wrote for each song. Mm-hmm. Just like um, John was supposed to have helped George with Taxman on certain certain lines in there. Right. The song. There's also some... Um, he also has some comments about the breakup, and um, he says it was sad when we broke up because we had been close for so long. Mick Jagger said at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame dinner that the Beatles were a four-headed monster. We never went anywhere without each other. We shared all the memories and the isolation of limos, hotels, planes, and concert halls, which is all we ever saw for years. And he said, like Jagger said at the Hall of Fame dinner, I would like to think we are all still friends because those were some of the best times of my life, and that is true. Hmm. Okay. Well, to there, I would say, this is what, what I find really interesting about interviews. It's that it, they're all important, regardless of when they took place. And in this particular case, here's George looking back and, and having a certain fondness for the Beatle years. If you had interviewed him probably in the early 70s, when he was really kind of relieved to have left the Beatles, you would have gotten a different answer altogether. Probably well, I, about think the some, I think you have to differentiate some of the comments. Uh, I mean, something like that, you know, I would take, I would put more significance on than some of the comments about the breakup. Only, I guess, because the breakup is just so, so complicated, you know, mm. um, and, you know, it's hard to, it, it's hard to pin that on any one thing. <laughs> let me get, let me get to Paul's quote. Okay. Um, which which really is is the the treasure trove of or, or is the the big scoop here of all the interviews he talks Paul talks about Paul evaluates the group and talks about um, what it, what each one brought to the table and let me let me read this so the four of us brought different things to the table John brought a biting wit I think I brought commercial commercial ability commerciality and harmony. My dad used to sit me and my brother down and say, this is harmony. So when it came to the group, I'd say to them, let's do a harmony on that one. And we'd gradually worked our way into things like that. George was serious, always very good on the business side and very good on his instrument. Ringo was simply the best drummer in Liverpool. Ringo also had native wit. He didn't know when he was being funny. The three of us went to grammar school. Ringo didn't. Ringo said he only went to school for three days because of this bad operation he had when he, went, when he was a kid. Ringo had perinonitis. His stomach had a lot of scars on it. His parents were told he died at age three, so with Ringo, everything was always a bonus. Mm. And I think that evaluation is just so, so fantastic. I mean, that, that's just immortal, what he, what he said there, because it's, it's all true. Oh, I don't know if I agree totally. <laughs> really? No, 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 I don't. I don't have to agree with everything that the Beatles have said. No, you don't. But I, I, I believe, I believe he's pretty well. I think he's pretty right. I think the the wit, 
John Swit, I think you can't you can't argue with that. I think. Oh no, not at all. But they they're all witty in their own way. Okay. All four of them. Which one but, do you which which evaluation do you think is wrong? Um, I think his own evaluation. Really? I mean, there's there's truth to it, but it's not. There's more to to each of them than what he said. It's kind of like I always resented when when people said. Uh, you know, that John was the witty one and Paul was the cute one and George was the quiet one and Ringo was the lovable, lovable one. There's more to the Beatles than that. You well, know, I, I mean, obviously he's, he's just, um, I mean, it's just a, a thumbnail sketch. Well, I think there's a danger in just a thumbnail sketch. Yes, Paul brought commerciality to the Beatles. There's no doubt about that. But there was also experimentation in Paul's songs. You know, it's it's not just uh, the fact that he was commercial. You think John's songs weren't commercial? Well, I I also think he's talking about. I think he's talking about initially. I don't think he's. It's really obvious why the media and everybody, you know, met, was uh, you know targeted Paul because I mean he was he really was the most commercial element. I mean he if there was a I don't know if he were putting the Beatles today. I ha hate to use this this comparison but if you were putting the Beatles today on American Idol Paul I think would be the be an easy choice for American uh, Idol today there's no doubt about the fact that he was the most commercial but the others were commercial too you know <laughs> they could be experimental and commercial at the same time well and, and the over, the course, were. over the course of the group yeah I mean there were there were all sorts of things that were working I'm, I'm basically thinking of looking at them on the Ed Sullivan show and you know well, that's one image. Well, true, and I, and I I I agree with that, and I think I think that's where Paul's speaking in there. In there. I think that's where he's where he's talking because um, he I mean he says he you know they brought different things to the table. I think that's the way it started out. It it ended up obviously quite you know a little differently because George you know George uh, George's talent really broke out by the end. Ringo. Ringo had his own, you know, little little niche, and and John, of course, really exploded as far as his his influence goes. So, mm. well, it involves talking about this far more thoroughly than we are right now. Right. You know, just to to summarize with you know a couple of sentences, it doesn't do justice to to any of the Beatles, but um, you know, I could see part of what Paul's saying there, but it's not the full picture. Mm -hmm. Not to me, anyway. And yeah, no, and I'm not saying I'm not saying it is the full picture. Right? Yeah. It's uh, it's obviously not. But I think it it's also significant that he characterizes what he sees in the group. Right. And I mean, we've you know we can sit here and and God knows how many books have evaluated what they were, but I mean he, he, that was what he saw, and I, I think that's I think that's very interesting and extremely significant. Hmm. Okay. I do want us to just bring up the thing about what he said about riding with John and comparing that to the others, because I thought that was really important. Mm -hmm. I thought that was probably the most interesting thing that, that was said when I read that interview. Um, one of the, another significant point in Paul's interview is where he talks about working with John. And he says, uh, no matter how we did it, we were just as happy working together in the accepted way of writing as we were keeping it loose, just as long as there was never a formula. I do miss it and him. It's very hard to replace someone like John. I should say impossible. I've worked with other people, and I've had fun with other people, and I've done stuff since the Beatles, like My Love and Maybe I'm Amazed, which I think stacks up with the Beatles. Interesting, he says that. But the co-written stuff has not been anywhere near as good as the songs I wrote with John. And of course, he, he, and he even gets a little more specific. He says, I'm my writing partner since John... Denny Lane was obviously nowhere near as good as John. Stevie Wonder is very good, but not lyrical. He's not a lyricist. Michael Jackson is not as good a writer as he is a performer. And Eric Stewart was good, but again, not as good as John. Wow. I mean, just what he had to say about those other people is mm -hmm. fascinating right there. Mm -hmm. Stevie Wonder's not a lyricist? I know. Did, did he say that, really? He said not very lyrical. It was, it was the exact term. And Michael Jackson's more a performer than a songwriter. That's what he said. Huh? He said he. Well, he said he's not a good of, as good of a writer as he is a performer. And I don't. I. I, I don't know. That. Uh, I don't know. 
I'd almost have to agree with that pretty much. But. It, it's shocking for Paul to give any kind of criticism, you know, but like you said, maybe this wasn't made for the press. Right. For a print interview, so this was very candid. Just the well, fact that the, he said the, that. The Denny Lane comment really stands out there. I mean, mm-hmm. to say, obviously nowhere near as good as John. I don't think if he was being, if he was going to be quoted in a newspaper, he would have said that. Yeah. And, uh, and obviously this was done before the Elvis Costello collaborations. Right. Since he didn't well, mention Elvis. No, he doesn't mention Elvis Costello at all. Hmm. Um, but this is really, uh, those are amazing words to come from him. From right. someone who, who normally is very guarded about everything that he says. Um, I remember, this, is just, this just flashed in my brain here. There was an interview that Paul did, Linda was with him for Playboy, and he made one comment about Michael Jackson at the time where he basically said it was all Quincy Jones music anyway. And I just went, what? <laughs> <laughs> You know, it, it's so out of character for him to even say anything critical in any way. But, you know, in a, I kind of feel kind of sad that he looks at his collaborations the way that he does, because obviously what he had with John and with the other Beatles was so special. But if you look at everything as though you can't top it, you certainly can't go into every collaboration thinking that way. Right. And uh, you have to look at it as if everyone that he's worked with they're all talented people in their own way. Denny Lane, Eric Stewart. I loved his work with Eric Stewart on Press to Play. Mm-hmm. I love the work he's done with Elvis Costello. I think oh, yeah. there are a lot. Uh, that's, that stuff really stands out, and I really, really, I think a lot of people have wondered why they didn't take that to another level. They didn't keep keep going with that because yeah. it was a, they made some great songs. Here's another quote. Um, I happen to have the the press release, the original press release from the book, and it has a quote that I don't remember seeing in the McCartney, in in there, or I passed over it, It said, we had captured Liverpool, we had captured London, it was like a military campaign, we were out to capture the world. Hmm. So there's there's another, there's another little choice, choice bit. But it's a great book, and and it's a, it's, very very available on Amazon. It's not real expensive. At least the last time I looked, it wasn't. So if you're interested in the book, by all means, it's called it's off the records, published by Warner Books, and it's one of these but, things that's been around for um, a long time. So that if you go to Amazon or Barnes and Noble, um, you should be able to get a copy fairly fairly cheaply. Can we just talk for a minute more about that thing about the comparisons there? Don't you think that what Paul said there really, it's it's kind of a sad statement if you think that he would go into each collaboration making a comparison. You have to let each collaboration and relationship develop. And I certainly wish that he had continued more with Eric Stewart because I felt that the songs he wrote with Eric on Press to Play were really strong. And it's the same thing with Elvis Costello. Who's to say that they couldn't have come up with some of, you know, Paul's best work or Elvis's best work? I liked I liked uh, Elvis Costello better myself. Although I do like uh, Press to Play, but um, yeah, I mean, it, it, they're both they're both good. Well, you shouldn't really go into a work relationship based on a comparison basis. Mm-hmm. I I certainly hope Paul doesn't go into whatever person he wants to work with thinking. How is this going to compare to John? Will it be ever as good as John? Right. Well, it's kind of self-defeating. I don't know that he still does. Uh, I, I, do you think he still does that now? I I'm have not. No, sure. Well, he hasn't really written with other people. Well, remember too, this was these interviews were in the eighties, right? Right after John's passing, so uh, that was probably still on his mind. I don't think it's. I don't think that's really on his mind as much anymore. I really don't. So probably that weighed on his mind. I'm sure it did at the time, sure. Mm. You know, I mean, the media, if you remember, the media was just, you know, it was just filled with Lennon stuff at the time. And, um, I mean, I, I think that's I think that's part of, probably part of that, where that came from. Yeah. So Good, good point. Very good point. So let's wrap up the show, and uh, we'd like to invite all of you to write to us here 
at things we said today. We have an email address, which is extremely long. That's how Steve has uh, devised this thing. <laughs> now you're going to blame me, huh? <laughs> of course. Things we said today at... No, 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 no. no, no, no. no. See, it's, it's so long, I can't remember it all. Things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. Right. And we have our own Facebook page, which is Things We Said Today. Please like us. We're very likable. Please, please like us. <laughs> please, please us. <laughs> and um, Steve has his own Facebook page. I have my own Facebook page. Under yes. his own name. Under my name. And I have mine, Ken Michaels, and I have my website, which is KenMichaelsRadio.com. And uh, we welcome any suggestions that you have for the show, any ideas, something that happened in the news that you'd like us to talk about and expand on. By all means, please write to us at, uh, once again, the email address, things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. So for Things We Said Today, I'm Ken Michaels, joined by Steve Marinucci, saying thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time. See you next time.